to how our laws are interpreted. We can do that while at the same time protecting the critical work that's being done by officials in the intelligence uh, community. And uh, with that, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, I would, uh, I'd be happy to yield to the distinguished chair of the committee. President. Senator from California is recognized. Mr. President, I'd like to take a moment to clarify this question of secret law. This is the law. It is not secret. This is all of the law guaranteeing the legality of what we do in the intelligence community. There is a whole section on congressional oversight. There's a whole section on additional procedures regarding persons inside the United States, persons outside of the United States. This, in fact, is the law. We can change the law. And Senator Wyden had something to do with Section 704. He did, in fact, change the law to put additional privacy protections in. And those privacy uh, protections are up for reauthorization in this bill. I'd like to address myself, if I could, to what Senator uh, Merkley said uh, in his comments. And I listened carefully. And what he was saying was opinions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court should, in some way, shape, or form, be made public, just as opinions of the Supreme Court or any court are made available to the public. And to a great extent, I find myself in agreement with that. They should be. Now, why can't they be? Because they mix the, the, the law and the particular circumstances are mixed together in the opinion. And so the particular circumstances are possibly classified. They may be names, they may be, uh, at, who knows what, what they are. But certainly, um, the opinion can either be written in a certain way for public release, or the Attorney General can be required to prepare a summary of what that opinion said for release to the public. There's one part of Senator Merkley's um, amendment, which I like very much, and that's on page 5, lines 3 to 11, which, said, which say, notwithstanding paragraph 2 and subject to paragraph 4, if the Attorney General makes a determination that a decision may not be classified and made available in a manner that protects the national security of the United States, including methods or sources related to national security, the Attorney General shall release an unclassified summary of such decision. I've talked to Senator Merkley about this, and um, uh, I've, I've offered my help in working to establish this. Um, the problem is we have four days, and this particular part of the law expires, Section 702 and 704. Uh, I think we can get it done. I think that this is a reasonable request, and I have offered to him uh, to write a letter. If that doesn't work, we will do another um, intelligence authorization bill next year, and that certainly uh, can be added to that bill. Um, so what's happening here is the term secret law is becoming also conflicting with what the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court uh, puts down in the form of opinions. And the law is here, and the law is public, and the opinions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court should be made available to the public in declassified form. Whether this can be done by the court or whether it has to be done by the Attorney General, I don't know at this time. But it can be done, and I think it should be done. I think that's a worthy thing. Then you have the law that's public, and you have the summary of the opinion, which is also public, and hopefully that helps this debate. So I have agreed uh, with Senator Merkley uh, to do that, and now I would ask unanimous consent that all quorum calls 
during debate on the FISA bill be equally divided between the proponents and opponents. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Mr. President, just um, to respond to the points made by the distinguished you know, chair of the committee, and, and by the way, I think uh, the chair's uh, reference to being willing uh, in the next intelligence authorization uh, bill to work with those of us and Senator Merkley's made uh, good points this afternoon to try to include language in the next intelligence authorization bill to deal with secret law. I think that would be very constructive. I appreciate the chair making that uh, suggestion. Colleagues may know that uh, under the leadership of, uh, of the chair and the distinguished senator from Georgia, the vice chair of the committee, Senator Chambliss, we were able uh, late last week to work out uh, the disagreements with respect to the intelligence authorization bill this year. I want to thank the chair for those efforts. I think we have a good, uh, good bill, and I think uh, uh, all of us are against leaks. That was what was uh, at issue. I think we've now dealt with the issue in a fashion so as to protect the First Amendment and the public's uh, right to, to know. And I appreciate uh, the chair's working with this senator on it. And I think we've got a good intelligence authorization uh, bill now for this year. And I think uh, the chair's uh, suggestion that uh, we look at dealing with this issue of secret law in addition, I hope, to passing the Merkley Amendment that we deal with it in the next intelligence uh, authorization bill is constructive. I do want to respond to one point on the merits with respect to the comments made by the distinguished chair on this issue. The distinguished chair of the committee has essentially said that the law is public because the text of the statute is public. That's true. That is not in dispute. It is true that the text of the law is public. But the secret interpretations of that law and the Fourth Amendment from the FISA court are not public. And the administration pledged three years ago to do something about that. It pledged it um, in writing in various kinds of uh, communications, and that still has not been done. So that is why this is uh, an important issue with respect to transparency and accountability. The distinguished chair of the committee is absolutely correct that the law is public. The text of the law is uh, public. Nobody disputes that, but the secret interpretations of the law and the Fourth Amendment, the interpretations of the FISA court are not public, and we have received pledges now for years that this would change. I remember uh, perhaps before the distinguished chair of the committee was here talking about how when Senator Rockefeller and I got a letter indicating that this was going to be changed, that we were very hopeful that we were going to again get more information with respect to legal interpretations, matters that ought to be public, that don't threaten uh, sources and methods and uh, and op operations, and we still have not, you know, gotten that. So that is the reason why Senator Merkley's work is uh, so important. I see my friend and, and colleague uh, here, and Senator Merkley, the distinguished chair of the committee, had made a point, I think, while you had to be out of the chamber, that the law is public because the text of it is public. But what you have so eloquently described has been our concern is that the opinions of the FISA court and their opinions and views about the Fourth Amendment are what has been secret. And the administration has said for years now that they would do something about it. And so your amendment seeks to give this the strongest possible push. And I think that's why your amendment is so important. And you're obviously making a lot of headway because the distinguished chair of the committee has also said that this issue of uh, secret law is something that can be addressed as well in the intelligence uh, authorization bill. So if we can pass your amendment and then move on to the intelligence authorization uh, bill, that will be 
uh, I think, a very uh, constructive way to uh, proceed very much in the public interest, and you're obviously making headway. Mr. President, if I could uh, yes. interject Senator a moment. Morgan. Of course. Thank you. I, I, uh, I, I, th I thank my colleague from Oregon for really spearheading this whole conversation about privacy and national security and how the two are really not at war with each other. We are simply looking for appropriate warrant processes and assurance of the public that the boundaries of privacy are being respected. And certainly a piece of that is, is the secret law and I appreciate the, the, the comments of, of the Chair of Intelligence uh, on, this, on this issue. And, and uh, I, I do feel that uh, in a democracy, understanding how a statute is interpreted is essential to the conduct of our responsibility in forging, forging laws and ensuring that the constitutional vision is protected. I, I, thank, uh, I thank my colleague, and he, he's making an important point. I, I have sat next to Senator Feinstein in the intelligence community now for 12 years. And I think all of us, and we've had chairs on both sides of the aisle, understand how important the work of the intelligence you know, community is. This is what prevents so many threats to our country from actually becoming realities, tragic you know, realities. And what my friend and colleague from Oregon really has hammered home this afternoon is that if the law is secret, and there's a big gap between the secret interpretation of a law and what the public thinks the law means. My friend and I represent people who, for example, could be using their laptop at home in Coos Bay and they look up a law and they see what the public interpretation you know, is and they later find out that that public interpretation is real different than what the government secretly says it is, when people learn that, they are going to be very unhappy. And I see that my colleague uh, uh, would like uh, some additional time to address this, and I'm happy to yield to him. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator White. And I, I just know you, you mentioned uh, an Oregonian sitting in Coos Bay working on uh, his or her laptop and uh, calling up uh, your office and saying, hey, uh, the law says that the government can collect tangible material related to an investigation. Does that mean that they can collect uh, all of my web uh, conversations, knowing that the web circuits travel around the world multiple times? At some point, they've passed through a foreign space. And uh, they ask this question in all sincerity because they care about the Fourth Amendment and their privacy. And uh, how much ability do you have to give them a definitive answer on that? Absent the information that we are seeking to get under the amendment that I'm going to offer, I don't think that it's possible for a senator to respond to your question. I mean, the issue for, I think, a individual senator would be, do you know whether anyone has ever estimated how many U.S. phone calls and emails have been warrantly, warrantlessly collected under the statute? Do you know whether any wholly domestic calls and emails have been collected under the statute? Which I believe is the exact question uh, my colleague from Oregon has asked. I don't believe a member of the United States Senate can answer that question. And being unable to answer that question really means that oversight here which is so often trumpeted on both sides of the aisle, is really toothless when it comes to the specifics. And I hope that's responded to my colleague's question. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think about other questions our constituents might ask. They might ask if, uh, if uh, our uh, spy agencies are collecting vast data from around the world and they become interested in, in a, a citizen, an American citizen, can they search all that data without getting a, a, a warrant, a warrant that's very specific to a probable cause and an affirmation? And again, I suspect the, the, the answer that we could give to the citizen would be that we can't provide, we, don't, we can't give a very precise evaluation of that, not knowing how the concept of information related to an investigation has, has been uh, uh, interpreted and, and laid out. My, my colleague is asking a particularly you know, important 
question because the director of the National Security Agency, General Alexander, recently spoke at a large um, technology you know, conference. And he said that with respect to uh, communications from a good guy, which we obviously interpret as law-abiding Americans and, and someone uh, overseas, the head of the National Security Agency said, and I quote, requirements from the FISA court and the Attorney General to minimize that, to uh, find uh, procedures to protect the individual, the law-abiding Americans' rights, essentially mean, in the words of General Alexander, nobody else can see it unless there's a crime that's been committed. So if people hear that answer to my colleague's question, which frankly General Alexander responded to directly, they pretty much say that's what they were hoping to hear, that nobody's going to get access to uh, their communications unless a crime has been committed. The only problem, I would say to my friend, is Senator Udall and I have found out that's not true. It's simply not true. The privacy protections provided by this minimization you know, approach are not as strong as General Alexander made them out oh, to uh, General Alexander. And he said, and I put this up on my website so um, all Americans can see uh, the response here. The general said, well, that's not really how the minimization procedures work. These minimization procedures that uh, have been described in such a glowing way and that the privacy protections aren't as strong as we've been led to believe. And he may have misspoken and uh, may have just been mistaken, but I'm not sure that the record would be correct even now had not Senator Udall and I tried to make an effort to follow it up. So I can tell you that at this very large technology conference. This was not something that was classified. At a very large technology uh, conference here recently in, uh, in Nevada, what the head of the National Security Agency said was taking place with respect to protecting you know, people in response to my colleagues' you know, questions, were there emails and phone calls protected? The general says to a big group, they really are unless a crime has been committed the real answer is that is not correct. Well, I thank my, my colleague uh, from Oregon for being so deeply uh, invested in the details of this over many, many years, uh, uh, utilizing a, a fierce advocacy uh, in support of the Fourth Amendment and, and privacy to bring to these, these debates. And I also do want to thank the, the Chair of Intelligence for her comments earlier today about secret law and, and her, her own concerns about that and willingness to help to work to have the administration uh, provide the type of information that clarifies uh, uh, how these secret opinions interpret statute. And so I, I thank you very much. Uh, my thanks goes to the Senator uh, from California, Senator Feinstein, for that offer. Thank you. I thank, uh, I thank my friend. Just one last point with respect to this technology you know, conference where so many people walked away and thought that their privacy was being protected by strong legal protections. General Alexander made an additional confusing uh, remark that was in response to that same question with respect to the protections of, uh, of law-abiding people. General Alexander said, and I quote, the story that we, the, the NSA, have millions or hundreds of millions of dossiers on people is absolutely false. Now, I indicated this morning as, uh, as well, uh, having served on the Intelligence uh, Committee for a long time, I do not have, uh, Madam President, the faintest idea of what anybody's talking about with respect uh, to a dossier. So Senator Udall and I followed that up as well. We asked the director to clarify that uh, statement. We asked, and I quote, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? So that 
two is a pretty straightforward question. The questions that senators have been asking about this are not, you know, real, you know, complicated. If you're asking whether the National Security Agency is addressing these privacy issues, I think it's one of the most basic questions you could ask. Does the National Security Agency collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? And if the agency saw fit, they could simply answer that with a yes or no. Instead, the director of the agency replied that while he appreciated our desire to have responses to those questions on the public record, there would not be a public response forthcoming. So, to go over the exchange again, the director of the National Security Agency states, and I quote, the story that we have millions or hundreds of millions of dossiers on people is absolutely false. Senator Udall and I ask then, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? And the agency is unwilling to answer the question. So that's what this debate is all about, is reforming the FISA Amendments you know, Act, and in particular, getting enough information so that it is possible for the Senate to say to our constituents, we are doing oversight over this program. And I think right now, based on what we have outlined over uh, the last uh, three or more hours, uh, Madam President, I think it's clear that on so many of the central you know, questions, the gap, for example, between the secret interpretations of the law and the public interpretation of the law, our inability to find out whether Americans and their wholly domestic uh, communications uh, have uh, had their rights uh, are violated, how many law-abiding Americans have had their emails and phone calls swept up under uh, FISA authorities, responses to these questions uh, that stem from public remarks made by intelligence officials at public uh, conferences, the inability to get answer to the answers to these questions means that this Senate cannot conduct the vigorous oversight that is our charge. So I uh, expect, uh, Madam President, we will have uh, uh, colleagues coming in with, uh, with the weather. It's uh, a special challenge uh, to get here from, uh, from our part of, uh, of, of the country. And uh, I, would, uh, I would note the absence of a quorum, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, I believe uh, parliamentary uh, inquiry on this, uh, the distinguished chair of the committee already, uh, I believe, got unanimous consent that the time in a quorum call be allocated to both uh, sides, and that was my understanding. Is that correct, Madam Chair? That is correct. All right. Madam Chair, with that, I would yield uh, the floor at this time. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. O'Connor. Note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Otaka.
for running the amendment. No. And we're standing by for senators to come back to the floor of the Senate and continue a debate this afternoon on FISA. Also, we're looking for a possible vote later on on relief to the victims of Hurricane Sandy. The House in at about an hour, 2 o'clock Eastern, for a pro forma session. And over on our companion network, C-SPAN, we expect to bring you remarks from minority, uh, Assistant Minority Leader Steny Hoyer, scheduled to have a press briefing about 2.15, and we expect he'll discuss the fiscal cliff. We'll have that for you over on C-SPAN. We'll continue to watch the Senate floor here, wait for senators to come back. Live coverage of the Senate always on C-SPAN 2. And as we wait for senators to come back to the floor, let's bring you remarks from about 10 o'clock this morning. Majority Leader Harry Reid, back from a couple of days off over the Christmas break, making remarks on the floor of the Senate. New Year's Eve is fast approaching, and for decades and decades, the American people have watched the ball drop in Times Square. It's the count, countdown to midnight, the start of a new year. But this year, Mr. President, the American people are waiting for the ball to drop, but it's not going to be a good drop. Because Americans' taxes are approaching the wrong direction. Come the first of this year, Americans will have less income than they have today. If we go over the cliff, and it looks like that's where we're headed, Mr. President, the House of Representatives, as we speak, with four days left after today before the first year, aren't here with the Speaker having told them they'll, have, they'll give them 48 hours notice. I can't imagine their consciences. They're out wherever they are around the country, and we're here trying to get something done. They are not in Washington, D.C. The House of Representatives are not here. They couldn't even get the leadership together yesterday. They had to do it with a teleconference. Republican leadership. If we go over the cliff, we'll be left with the knowledge that could have been prevented with a single vote in the Republican-controlled House of Representatives. Mr. Speaker, prior to this session starting today, the presiding officer and I had a conversation about how things have changed around here. I served in the House of Representatives. There's 435 members of the House. What goes on in this country shouldn't be decided by the majority. It should be decided by the whole House of Representatives. Everyone knows, including the Speaker of the House of Representatives today, that if they had brought up the House, I'm sorry, the Senate passed bill that would give relief to everyone making less than $250,000 a year, it would pass overwhelmingly. Every Democrat would vote for it, and Republicans would vote for it. But the Speaker, he says, no, we can't do that. It has to be a majority of the majority. So they have, they've done nothing. He even tried to bring up the bill last week to show they could defeat it. They couldn't do that even. They couldn't defeat the bill that passed here in the Senate. The American people, I don't think, understand the House of Representatives is operating without the House of Representatives. It's being operated with a dictatorship of the Speaker, not allowing the vast majority of the House of Representatives to get what they want. If the 250 would, would be brought up, it would pass overwhelmingly, I repeat. On any given day for the last five or six months, since July 25th, Speaker Boehner could have brought the Senate passed middle class tax cut legislation to a vote in the House. And it would pass. But he's doing, 
he has made the decision that he's not going to let a vote on that. Because if he let it be voted upon, it would pass. I've said here, Mr. President, it's not too late for the Speaker to take up the Senate pass bill. But I, that, that time is even winding down. Today is Thursday. He's going to give 48 hours notice to the House before they come back. So 48 hours from today is Saturday. With just that one vote, middle class families would have the security that their taxes wouldn't go up by at least $2,200 on New Year's Day. That's the average. Some would go up more, some less, of course. Speaker Boehner should call members of the House back to Washington today. He shouldn't have let them go, in fact. They're not here. They are not here. John Boehner seems to care more about keeping his speakership than about keeping the nation on firm financial footing. It's obvious, Mr. President, what's going on around here. He's waiting until January 3rd to get reelected as speaker before he gets serious with negotiations because he has so many people over there that won't follow what he wants. That's obvious from the debacle that took place last week. And it was a debacle. He made an offer to the president. The president came back. They're just a little bit apart. And he walked away from that and went to plan B, which all it did is whack people who need help the most. Poor people. And he couldn't even pass that. Remember, he's not letting the House of Representatives vote. He's letting the Republicans vote. It was so bad and he was in such difficult shape there, he wouldn't even allow a vote to take place with his Republicans because he knew he would lose. For months, he's allowed House Republicans to hold middle-class taxpayers hostage to protect the richest 2%. And the funny part about that, Mr. President, the 2% don't want to be protected. The majority of rich people in, this, in, in our great country are willing to pay more. The only people that disagree with that are Republicans who work in this building. The Speaker just has a few days left to change his mind. But I have to say, be very honest, Mr. President. I don't know, time-wise, how it can happen now. Everyone knows we can't bring up anything here unless we do it by unanimous consent because the rules have been so uh, worked the last few years that we can't do anything without 60 votes. There's 53 of us. After the first year, there'll be 55 of us. I would hope that the Speaker and the Republican leader here in the Senate would come to us and say, here's what we think will work. Let's find out what that could be. Because uh, as the Speaker can't pass, it seems, much of anything over there. On the Sunday shows, they had Republican senators, and they were asked on the Fox network, pretty conservative, and that's probably a gross understatement, would you filibuster a bill that the, the president's bill? They refused to answer. Well, we don't, we, we don't make that decision. We can't answer that. Well, filibuster is, is over all of our heads, Mr. President. That's why we have to look seriously next year at changing the rules around here. The bill that has passed the House, uh, I'm sorry, the bill that has passed the Senate protects 98% of families, 97% of small businesses. They passed a bill in the House that we defeated. That is, extend the tax cuts for everybody. That was voted down over here. The President said he would veto it. So this happy talk that uh, this Republican House leadership said uh, yesterday, let them take our bill. Mr. President, that bill was brought up and it was defeated. I repeat, the American people do not agree with the Republicans in the House and the Republicans over here. The 
way to avoid the fiscal cliff has been right in the face of the Republican leaders, both McConnell and Boehner, for days and days and days and days, going into weeks and months. And it's the only option that's a viable escape route. That's the Senate passed bill. It wouldn't be hard to pass. I've talked about that at some length. Every Democrat in the House would vote for it. A handful of Republicans would vote for it. That's all would be needed. But Mr. President, Grover Norquist is standing in the way of this. Not the rich people, but Grover Norquist. The man who says what the Republicans can do. So I say to the Speaker, take the escape hatch that we've left you. Put the economic fate of the nation ahead of your own fate as Speaker of the House. Millions of middle-class families are nervously watching, waiting, and counting down the moments until their taxes go up. Nothing can move forward in regards to our budget crisis unless Speaker Boehner and Leader McConnell are willing to participate in coming up with a bipartisan plan. Speaker Boehner is unwilling to negotiate. We've not heard a word from Leader McConnell, There's n and nothing's happening. Democrats can't put together a plan on their own because without participation of Leader McConnell and Speaker Boehner, nothing can happen on the fiscal cliff. And so far, they are radio silent. Mr. President, we're going to work the next couple of days to get the most important uh, legislation done on FISA. There should be a good debate. We have people uh, that are interested in changing what we have on the floor. There may be a series of amendments on trying to change FISA, the espionage legislation that guides this country. It should be a good debate. We have to finish the stimu I'm sorry, this, the supplemental appropriation bill. It's so important for the people in the Northeast. Uh, we have a lot to do. There could be as many as 20 votes on this in the next uh, few days. We are here in Washington working while the members of the House of Representatives are out uh, watching movies and watching their kids play soccer and basketball and doing all kinds of things. They should be here. They should be here urging the speaker, let's bring up the 250. Let's not have middle class Americans and small businesses get hurt. So we're waiting for senators to return to the floor here. The business at hand uh, in the Senate this afternoon, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, an extension of that act. Also, a uh, $60 billion relief package for areas affected by Hurricane Sandy. And we expect a vote on one of those items at least about 5.30 this afternoon. In about 35 minutes or so, the House scheduled to come back at 2 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, pro forma session is what's planned. No legislative work expected. Of course, that could change based on the status of the so-called fiscal cliff negotiations. You may have seen over on C-SPAN earlier, President Obama landing uh, with Air Force One a couple of hours ago, returning overnight from Hawaii. And... The president in town. We also just saw Senator Reid making remarks this morning on the floor of the U.S. Senate. We do expect remarks from Steny Hoyer, the assistant uh, leader or the uh, uh, the minority assistant leader in the House, to make remarks to reporters about 2:15. This afternoon, we'll have that live for you on C-SPAN. In the meantime, as we wait for senators to return, let's bring you a portion of this morning's Washington Journal. Former presidential candidate and author Steve Forbes was our guest uh, from New York City talking about the fiscal cliff. Now joining us from our New York City studio is the chairman and editor-in-chief of Forbes Media, and that is Steve Forbes, former presidential candidate. He'll be with us for the next 45 minutes to take your calls and talk about some of the uh, fiscal issues facing Washington today. Mr. Forbes, let's start with where we started this morning on the Washington Journal. As a business owner, have you looked at the fiscal cliff and have you made plans or altered your 2013 spending uh, as a business owner on this issue? Uh the, an the answer is not yet because uh, the big uh, factor is going to be ultimately what happens in health care, uh, which kicks in in 2013 and 2014. Until we get a better fix on what the rules are going to be there, uh, you're kind of uh, immobilized. 
So uh, we're moving ahead doing the projects that we're doing, but uh, we do see an impact in terms of uh, people, in terms of advertising marketing budgets. Uh, people are being very cautious there. And so uh, we, we, we hope uh, this thing will be uh, successfully resolved and we don't go into a recession next year. Herbs, <clears throat> how would you like to see this issue played out in Washington? What, in your view, is the best economic solution? Well, the, the best economic solution is one they're not going to do, and that is to avoid raising taxes. And so I think the best we can hope for now is that they, uh, for once, kick the can down the road for a couple of months. You're not going to resolve the tax code in the next uh, few days. You're not going to resolve entitlements in the next uh, few days. So recognize some of these issues are going to take some very serious negotiation and discussion. You've got the debt ceiling crisis coming. Uh, I think it'll probably be February, not December 31st, but that's on the immediate horizon. So instead of uh, this crisis thing where you save everything for the last minute, it, uh, try to do it in a more uh, deliberate fashion, and I think uh, that would be better than doing a bad deal, quick deal, and then uh, weeks later we find out they stuffed uh, stuff in the legislation that uh, no one knew was there. Uh, 5949, that's... and that my time in so speaking be charged against Senator Wyden. Without objection. Madam President, in this dangerous world, we have an obligation to give our intelligence community the tools and the resources that they need to keep us safe. But we also have a fundamental obligation, just as great, I believe, to protect the civil liberties of law-abiding American citizens. A right to private communications, free from the prying eyes and ears of the government, should be the rule, not the exception, for American citizens on American soil whom law enforcement has no reason to suspect of wrongdoing. And yet the legislation that we debate on this Senate floor today, the FISA Amendments Act or the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Amendments Act, would reauthorize surveillance authority that most Americans, most of the Delawareans whom I represent, would be shocked to learn that the government has in the first place. Under Section 702, FISA permits the government to wiretap communications in the United States without a warrant if it reasonably believes the target of the wiretap to be outside of the country and has a significant purpose of acquiring foreign intelligence information. Of course, communications are by definition between two or more people. So even if one participant is outside our country, the person they're talking to may be here in the United States and they may well be an American citizen. Under this legislation, the government is permitted to collect and store their communications, but without clear legal limits on what can be done with this information. They can keep it for an indefinite period of time. They can search within these communications and use them in civilian criminal investigations. And perhaps most concerning of all to me, they can search information obtained under this act for the communications of a specific individual U.S. citizen without judicial oversight and for any reason. If these are all true and this is the case, then I am gravely concerned. What is at issue today is the scope of the government's power to conduct surveillance without getting a warrant. The warrant requirement is enshrined in our legal system from the very founding of our nation because we believe in judicial checks and balances. If the government suspects wrongdoing by a U.S. citizen, it must convince a judge to approve a warrant. Warrants are issued each and every day in courts across the United States for investigation of potential offenses across the whole spectrum of criminal activity, including crimes affecting national security. In contrast, surveillance under this act is not required to meet this standard, leaving American citizens vulnerable to potentially very real violations of their privacy rights. Madam President, the balance between privacy and security is an essential test for any government, but it is a vital test for our government and for this country. And this law, in my view, does not contain some essential checks that are supposed to protect our privacy. This law in its current form does contain some checks that I want to review that are supposed to protect our privacy. 
It requires that the government surveillance program must be reasonably designed to target foreigners abroad and not intentionally acquire wholly domestic communications. The law requires that a wiretap be turned off when the government knows it is listening in on a conversation between two U.S. individuals. And it forbids the government from targeting a foreigner as a pretext for obtaining the communications of a U.S. national. All three of these are important privacy protections currently in the law. The problem is, we here in the United States Senate, and so the citizens we represent, don't know how well any of these safeguards actually work. We don't know how courts construe the law's requirement that surveillance be, as I mentioned, reasonably designed not to obtain any purely domestic information. The law doesn't forbid purely domestic information from being collected. We know that at least one FISA court has ruled that a surveillance program violated the law. Why? Those who know can't say, and average Americans can't know. We can suspect that U.S. communications occasionally do get swept up in this kind of surveillance. But the intelligence community has not, in fact, they say they cannot, offered us any reasonable estimate of the number or frequency with which this has happened. The government also won't state publicly whether any wholly domestic communications have been obtained under this authority. And the government won't state publicly whether it has ever searched this surveillance, this body of communications, for the communications of a specific American without a warrant. For me, this lack of information, this lack of understanding, this lack of detail about exactly how the protections in this act have worked is of, as I said, grave concern. Too often this body finds itself in the position of having to give rushed consideration to the extension of expiring surveillance authorities. The intelligence community tells us these surveillance tools are indispensable to the fight against terrorism and foreign spies just as they did during the Patriot Act reauthorization debate last year. Also, as in the case of the Patriot reauthorization, the expiration of these authorities, we were told, the impending expiration of these authorities, would throw ongoing surveillance operations into a legal limbo, would cause investigations to collapse or harm our ability to track terrorists and prevent crimes, and all of these are profound and legitimate concerns. It is precisely because this legislation is so important that it is all the more deserving of the Senate's careful, timely, and deliberate attention. This kind of serious consideration requires more declassified information on the public record than we have available now. That's why I am supporting the amendments reported by the Judiciary Committee on which I serve, which would help to shine a light on exactly how this surveillance authority is used. It would direct the intelligence community inspector general to issue a public report explaining whether and how the FISA Amendments Act respects the privacy interests of Americans. This amendment would also give us another chance to amend this FAA after we receive this report by adjusting the sunset not to 2017 but to 2015. This new expiration date would align the sunset of the FISA Amendments Act with those in the Patriot Act, allowing for a more comprehensive review of both surveillance authorizations. Concerns about privacy rights of law-abiding American citizens, as well as the striking lack of current public information, are also why I support Senator Merkley's amendment to direct the administration to establish a framework for declassifying FISA court opinions about the FAA. Secure sources and methods vital to the success of our intelligence community must be protected, and I agree with that. And this amendment would do that. But the default, the default position here ought to be that the legal analysis about the government's use of warrantless surveillance in this country is public rather than hidden from view. I also strongly support Senator Wyden's amendment to force the intelligence community to provide Congress and the public as appropriate, with specifics on just how much domestic communication has been captured under the FAA and what the intelligence community does with that information. This amendment simply asks for the most basic information about the practical consequences of the use of the powerful surveillance authorities in this act. To what extent are these authorities being used 
to discover the content of private conversations by U.S. citizens. What is the order of magnitude? We don't know. To me, this amendment is simply common sense. The Delawareans for whom I work, the nation for whom we work, expects that the government cannot listen in on their phone calls or read their emails unless a judge has signed a warrant. If there's a reason why this requirement is not consistent with national security, then I say let the intelligence community make that case and allow us to debate that and consider it in public. It is to me simply not acceptable for the intelligence community to ask us to surrender our civil liberties and then refuse to tell us with any specificity why we must do so, the context and the scale of the exercise of this surveillance authority. In my view, America's first principles demand better. So I thank Senator Wyden for his leadership on this issue, and I thank Majority Leader Reid for ensuring we have the opportunity to debate and consider these amendments and the very important issues that they reflect here today. I urge all of my colleagues to consider carefully and then support these amendments to the FAA. We cannot let the impending deadline distract us from the important opportunity to conduct oversight and implement responsible reforms. To simply be rushed to passage when we have known the deadline was approaching for years strikes me as an abrogation of our fundamental oversight responsibility. In my view, this chamber deserves a full and informed debate about our intelligence gathering procedures and their potentially very real impact on Americans' privacy rights. And we need it sooner rather than later. These amendments would allow us to have that conversation and to work together on a path that strikes the essential balance between privacy and security for the citizens of these United States. Thank you. And with that, Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hancock. Madam President. Senator from Kentucky. I rise today in support of the Fourth the Amendment. Quorum call, Senator. Excuse me? There's a quorum call. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to vitiate the quorum call. Without objection. Madam President, I rise today in support of the Fourth Amendment Protection Act. The Fourth Amendment guarantees the right of the people to be secure in their persons, their houses, and their papers and their effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. John Adams considered the fight against general warrants or what they called in those days writs of assistance. He considered this fight to be when the child independence was born. Our independence and the Fourth Amendment go hand in hand. They emerge together. To discount or to dilute the Fourth Amendment would be to deny really what constitutes our very republic. But somehow along the way, we became lazy and haphazard in our vigilance. We allowed Congress and the courts to diminish our Fourth Amendment protections, particularly when we gave our papers to a third party, once you gave information to an Internet provider or to a bank. Once we allowed our papers to be held by a third party, such as telephone companies or internet providers, the courts determined that we no longer had a legally recognized expectation of privacy. Now, there have been some dissents over time. Justice Marshall dissented in the California Bankers Association versus Schultz case, and he wrote these words. The fact that one has disclosed private papers to a bank for a limited purpose within the context of a confidential customer-bank relationship does not mean that you have waived all right to the privacy of your papers. But privacy in the Fourth Amendment has steadily lost ground over the past century. From the California Bankers Association case to Smith versus Ver Maryland to U.S. versus M Miller, the majority has ruled that your records, once they're held by a third party, 
don't deserve the same Fourth Amendment protections. Ironically, though, digital records seem to get less protection than paper records. As the National Association of Defense Attorneys has pointed out, since the 1870s, the government must get a warrant to look and read your mail, and since the case Katz versus the United States, the government has been required to have a warrant to tap your phone. However, under current law, your email, your text messages, and other electronic communications do not receive the same level of protection as your phone calls do. Why is a phone call deserving of more protection than your email or your text? Justice Sotomayor in U.S. versus Jones, the recent Supreme Court case that says the government can't put a GPS tracking device on your car without a warrant, said this. She says, I for one doubt that people would accept without complaint the warrantless disclosure of the government to the government of a list of every website they have visited in the last week, month, or year. I would not assume that all information voluntarily disclosed to some member of the public for a limited purpose is for that reason alone disentitled to the Fourth Amendment protections. Justices Marshall and Brennan, dissenting in Smith versus Maryland, said and emphasized the dangers of giving up Fourth Amendment protections. They wrote, the prospect of government monitoring will undoubtedly prove disturbing even to those with nothing illicit to, to hide. Many individuals, including members of unpopular political organizations or journalists with confidential sources, may legitimately wish to avoid disclosure of their personal contacts. In Miller and in Smith, the Supreme Court held that the Fourth Amendment did not protect records held by third parties. Sotomayor wrote in the Jones case that it may be time to reconsider these cases, reconsider how they were decided, that their approach is, in her words, ill-suited to the digital age, in which people reveal a great deal of information about themselves to third parties in the course of carrying out mundane tasks. Today, this amendment that I will present, the Fourth Amendment Protection Act, does precisely that. This amendment would restore the Fourth Amendment protection to third party records. This amendment would simply apply the Fourth Amendment to modern means of communications. Emailing and text messaging would be giving the same protections we currently give to telephone conversations. Some may ask, well, why go to such great lengths to protect records? Isn't the government just interested in the records of bad people? Well, to answer this question, you must imagine your visa statement and imagine what information is on your visa statement. From your visa statement, the government may be able to ascertain what magazines you read, whether you drink and how much, whether you gamble and how much, whether you're a conservative, a liberal, a libertarian. Whom do you contribute to? Who's your preferred political party? Whether you attend a church, a synagogue, or a mosque? whether you see a psychiatrist, what type of medication do you take. By poring over your visa statement, the government can pry into every aspect of your personal life. Do you really want allow, to allow your government unfettered access to sift through millions and millions of records without first obtaining a judicial warrant? If we have people who are accused of committing a crime, we go before a judge and get a warrant. It's not that hard. You, I'm not saying we won't be allowed to look through records, but I'm just saying that the mass of ordinary innocent citizens should not have their records rifled through by a government who does not first have to ask a judge for a warrant before they look at your personal records. We have examples in the past, in our own country, of abuses of government. During the civil rights era, the government snooped on activists. During the Vietnam era, the government snooped on anti-war protesters. In a digital age where computers can process billions of bits of information, we want the government to have unfettered access to every detail of our lives. From your visa statement, the government can determine what diseases you may or may not have, whether you're impotent, manic, depressed, whether you're a gun owner, whether you buy ammunition, whether you're an animal rights activist, whether you're an environmental activist what books you order, 
what blogs you read, what stores or internet sites you look at. Do you really want your government to have free and unlimited access to everything you do on your computer? The Fourth Amendment was written in a different time and a different age, but its necessity and its truth are timeless. The right to privacy, and for that matter, the right to private property are not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. But the Ninth Amendment says that the rights not stated are not to be disparaged or denied. James Otis, arguably the father of the Fourth Amendment, put it best when he said, one of the most essential branches of English liberty is the freedom of one's house. A man's house is his castle, and whilst he is quiet, he is as well guarded as a prince in his castle. Today's castle may be your apartment, and who knows, you know, where the information is coming from. It may be paper in your apartment, but it may be bits of data stored who knows where. But there is a reason why we should have our government, why our government should be restrained from invading a sphere of privacy that is a timeless concept. Over the past few decades, our right to privacy has been eroded. The Fourth Amendment Protection Act would go a long way to restoring this cherished and necessary right. I hope that my colleagues will consider supporting, defending, and enhancing the Fourth Amendment, bringing it into a modern age when modern electronic and computer information and communications are once again protected by the Fourth Amendment. Thank you, and I, I reserve the balance of my time. Um, no, he hasn't called enough. Go ahead. Can you, can you call? Yeah,